my pleasure to um, introduce Professor Pilcher to our last seminar session this year. And Professor Pilcher's work has deeply impacted the field of blue history. And his work has truly enriched and empowered the field because he repeatedly gives voice to immigrant workers and immigrant cuisine and directs our attention to food inequality by raising questions about the fair pay, safe workplaces, and also addressing consumer anxiety. He's the author of many books and numerous articles, and as Professor David Parker was pointing out last night, his books have the best titles. <coughs> In his book, K. Vivian Les Tamales, Food and Making of Mexican Identity was published in 1998. The Sausage Rebellion, Public Health, <laughs> Private Enterprise and Meat in Mexico City in 2006. And he also published Food and World History in 2006, which is currently on its third edition. And I would actually like to add here that my own journey of food history started with his book. So that book has a very special place in my heart. Also his book Planet Taco, a global history of Mexican food published in 2012, has, all his books actually I would say, has transcended not just the academic boundary, but has a mass appeal. His books are widely read by people interested in the field. He is the articles editor for the Journal of Global Food History, and he has also edited the Oxford Handbook of Food History, again in 2012 that was published. Uh, again, I would like to point out the uh, Oxford Handbook of Food History is a great source for anyone interested in the subject, great pedagogical tools as well. And a four-volume anthology from Bloomsbury entitled Food History, Critical and Primary Sources that was published in 2040. He's currently working on two major projects. The first is dedicated to mapping and analyzing histories of multicultural foods in Toronto, from First Nations to the contemporary age global migration. This is a short-supported project that encourages active participation <coughs> from student researchers who contribute to the project through interactive historical maps, stories of culinary icons, and oral histories, and the project website is publicly available. Now his second current project, for which we are going to learn more about that, is the world history of beer over the past 200 years. It follows the spread of European blogger through networks of trade, migration, and empire. The research moves between global and the local, explore how European brews became situated within the drinking cultures of Mexican poke. I learned about poke just last night. Japanese sake, South African shogun beer, among others. Now, Professor Pilcher has also helped establish Food Studies Minor Program in U of T Scarborough, where he is currently based. He has taught at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, and the University of Gastronomic Sciences in Palenzo, Italy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pilcher and learning about how to travel, trade, and taste make beer a global commodity. Thank you for the very kind introduction and for the invitation and just for showing up at the end of the long semester. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, incidentally, just a, a comment about, you know, I, I, when I moved to Canada, of course, as, as everyone does, I, I, I had to apply for a SHRC grant. And, um, and, and I, I just, I realized that SHRC was not going to pay me to travel around the world drinking beer. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was like, what, what can I do then? And so, you know, putting students to work, you know, on, on the history of Toronto food seemed like a, a better bet. And sure enough, I got the money, although... You know, <laughs> administering the short program is a uh, grant is always the challenge. Um, but anyway, so but but today we're talking about beer, and um, uh, setting my little clock as a reminder. Um, yeah, so we're talking about beer, and actually I'm in a pretty good uh, place right now. So I've given a, a, a version of this talk for for quite a while now. Uh, really, I started the, program, uh, the, the project right after I, after after the uh, after the taco book came out, and so it's it's been ten years. Uh, but this is the first 
version of this talk that I'm giving after I think I've sort of figured out what the thesis statement is, you know? And, and, and I mean, and that's always kind of a moment that happens either before or after the book actually comes out. It's, it's, it's always better when it's before, but anyway, so, so I've, I've actually written up a version of it, and now I'm going to see if I can kind of articulate it. So, 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 so bear with me. But anyway, so it's, it's, um, it was always that before some kind of, you know, sort of how beer traveled the world, but now, you know, sort of trying to emphasize that, that commodity nature. And of course, as we know, you know, the, the, the meanings of commodities change historically in different situations. And so, you know, this in, in a way is a nice uh, kind of, or hopefully it's a nice way of looking at the history of capitalism and how kind of an everyday product can kind of, you know, sort of, you know, how we make beer, but then also how we make meaning around beer. Um, and of course, uh, commodity at, at one level is just a, a, a useful good, right? In the ancient world, that was the meaning of it. Um, and, and it was sort of associated with a marketing, a marketed good, so something you would buy from others rather than, you know, subsistence. And, and to this day, that kind of home brewing versus, you know, kind of commercial brewing is, is a thing within the, within the beer world. Um, but, and, and certainly the, the increasing commercialization has had a, a, a major impact on beer. And, and for one thing, that, you know, in, in the ancient world, and, in, in many societies, that homebrewing was always a woman's task, right? And, and it's be no surprise to, to, to you know, people who wear kind of feminist labor history, you know, once there's money to be made, men take over the job, right? And so the kinds of changes that happen uh, are, are, are certainly important ones in that sort of commercial uh, process. And also, you know, sort of the industrial, the, the changes with the rise of industry. Know, and, and kind of, I mean, you know, standardization. And, and, and when we think of commodities, oftentimes we think of, of agricultural goods, right, and the ways that, that they become, uh, you know, organic entities. Or people try to impose standardization and grading on them. And, and certainly that's, that's part of the story uh, with beer. Um, but, you know, also kind of the ways that it's marketed and, soon as well. So there's a lot kind of going on here, and hopefully we can kind of make sense of it. But, but the, the real, I guess, kind of, uh, kind of catch uh, hook for this is, and, and this is my favorite uh, beer quote um, uh, from uh, that great intellectual Frank Zappa. Uh, but but a, a nice illustration of this idea that you can't be a real country unless you have a beer and an airline I think is, is from, this is from uh, puretravel.com, right, and it's, it's around the world in 80 beers, right, every country and its sort of iconic beer, right, so of course Molson Canadian, um, Budweiser in the United States, Corona in Mexico, but then, you know, Qingdao and, and Castle Lager in South Africa and Kingfisher in India and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but once you get past the, the name on the label, what's really striking is that these are all exactly the same beer. Okay. Okay. Um, what, it's, it's, the, the, the kind of technical term for the style is pale lager. Um, and, and really one of the things that already in the 1960s people were beginning to notice was that Consumers actually could not tell the difference between one beer and another, and they always, you know, they always would tell these marketing researchers, "Oh yes, my favorite is this, and I, I will always know it." But when presented with, you know, these things, in blah, they, they couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> uh, the, the, the one exception to this, uh, which kind of proves the rule, is you can't see it on this map, but but Ireland, of course, is Guinness. Uh, and, it is a bit different, but I think I think that really is the exception that proves the rule. But even you know, like like you know, uh, predominantly Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia, they're on there with you know, kind of Bex non-alcoholic beer, uh, which apparently is known as Mullah Light. Um, and uh, so anyway, so 
the, the question then is, you know, kind of how did we get to this world of beer in which, you know, there's sort of brand names all over the place, but it's really all the same beer. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, we can kind of reach back and look at, you know, these traditional beer styles, right, that are attached to particular regions, right? And I picked three versions of this, uh, the United Kingdom and um, Belgium and Germany, but we could have, you know, done the same sort of thing with other places as well. And, and um, so the, the different... Uh, uh, beer styles, as they're called, in, in different regions of, of Britain. Uh, and this is particularly the case uh, with, with Belgium and, and, and the, um, uh, the, 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 the farmhouse, uh, and, and, and in particular the, um, the kind of, uh, the, the sort of these, these um, well, I, 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 the problem is, is I, I, get, I immediately plunge into beer geek and I, 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 I have to find that happy medium between, because I mean, it's a, it's a topic that really just, you want to get technical, you want to sort of explain everything, and, 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 and the real challenge for this project has been to sort of find that happy level where, where the beer geeks are not completely turned off, but the rest of the audience is not completely lost. But, but the, the, the point here is, is that, you know, each of these uh, regions within these countries, they have very different kinds of beers. And uh, you know, even in, in, a, in a, 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 a place like Bavaria, right, you can see you know very different beers as, as you travel around from one place to the other. And so uh, you know that sort of standardization. How did we get to this kind of uniform, standardized pale lager uh, from this this great diversity? But in some ways, I guess I would like to take that step even back further and look at um, what the kind of the world of home brewing uh, and the ways that, that various kinds of things, and, and I use the term beer very loosely uh, as just any, you know, kind of fermented grain-based beer or things that are kind of like it. Mexican pulque is actually made from the, sap, uh, of the agave plant, a uh, 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 succulent, but it, it is, is, is close enough to be like beer that, that, that we can, I, that I included besides all Mexicans. I had it. Uh, but you know you've got these these medieval ale wives of Europe making their beers, but also um, this is a, a, a Bolivian woman with her uh, her corn beer chicha. Um, these are, are Zulu brewers in South Africa making um, millet and sorghum beers, and uh, these these women uh, sake brewers, right? And, and so a real global diversity of beers, and and and, and how we. Um, how how this this particular European version spreads out over the world, and, and you know even in all of these countries now, the the leading um, beverages are are you know pale lagers. They they displaced in, in in many ways these 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 traditional um, brews. Okay, so and how did this happen? And and one other thing I guess that that uh, I should tell you is is just sort of. Uh, explaining this, this commodification is that this is going to be a history of beer styles, okay? of, of the ways that um, varieties of beer like pale lager or like Guinness Stout uh, came to be, came to be. Okay? And it's, it's, it's actually uh, um, not really this, this notion of it turns out that, that these kinds of, of beers were always traditionally in their place, uh, and then uh, you know eventually the pale lager came to, to, to wipe them all out. What I want to suggest instead is that these traditional beer styles were just as much a product of capitalism as were uh, as was as as, as all is the, the, the pale lager that we you know, now uh, drink in, in, in many of the, in, 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 its, in its endless labels, if not its forms. So that's, that's kind of uh, the argument I'm making. And to do this, I want to start with uh, the first industrial beer, London Porter, okay, which was 
uh, according to legend, invented uh, about 1718 by a, a London brewer named Harwood, uh, who um, made a, a, it was a, 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 it's a brown beer, uh, a, a heavy one, and it was um, mixing different sort of types of, of beers, and, and, and that became the, the porter. And it's named after London, you know, the, 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 the workers who were sort of instrumental for that uh, market. Um, uh, but the thing about uh, 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 Porter, the, 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 it's a dark beer, and part of the reason for that was that the early industrial machinery uh, was pretty primitive, and they had to make that, that kind of strong tasting beer uh, to, to cover the flaws of early industrialization. Uh, and it really takes about 100 years before the, um, the, the, the industrial quality control makes a drinkable beer that, that wasn't this kind of burnt charcoal kind of flavor uh, that, that, that these early uh, porters had. Um, curiously, uh, it was not actually a product of um, innovation, of technological innovation. That scale preceded um, the kinds of improvements in brewing technology. Um, that, that basically, uh, the, the growing London working class and demand for uh, this beer uh, meant that they were brewing ever larger um, vats of it. And it got to the point where they had so much capital invested that they had to start incorporating using new technologies like uh, thermometers to make sure that the, the, that the beer did not sort of ferment too much and, and, and ruin it, or uh, temperators, which are these little coils that run through to regulate the temperature so that, again, it doesn't get too hot, right, to maintain control over the brewing process. Um, and, uh, and, and eventually, it got to the point by the end of the 19th century, uh, or the end of the 18th century, rather, so, yeah, that, that um, they were able to take those new um, for new technologies and brew pale ale, uh, which had formerly been the, the beer of the elite. Right? They would take the finest uh, barley and hops and, and, and make it in small batches compared to the giant vats that, that were used uh, to make port. Uh, and and the, these, these vats would be aged to kind of mellow out the flavor. Um, but what they realized, uh, again, with this, as, as they start to, as the technology improves, um, was that it was actually more efficient to make pale ale, even though it was kind of the more expensive beer than it was to make porter. And the reason for this was that in getting that dark brown color, uh, they had to, to scorch the, the, the malt, which, of course, you know, burns up the fermentable product, right? The sugars uh, in the malt. And, um, and, and, and so it was a very inefficient way of doing it. And eventually what they started doing by about 1810 or so was they would brew pale ale and then add back uh, the color, either through just straight caramel sugar or um, through what comes to be known as patent malt. It's, a, it's like using coffee toast roasters. To, to, to get the dark color, and, and it just you know, add a little bit of, of that back to get the color you're looking for. Um, but the point is, is that by this point, by the early 19th century, uh, the market has really shifted uh, to that uh, pale ale, right? That, 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 that it becomes cost efficient, and that the growing London middle class, uh, an English middle class, British middle class, really, um, are, are liking the sort of mellow flavors of, of the pale ale. Um, and so the porter makers are really kind of under the gun here, and um, and what what the, the historian of technology um, uh, James Summer has called the retrospective invention, right? That 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 origin story of Harwood and, and these other kinds of things uh, was actually invented as a, a way of of product differentiation, of trying to create a nostalgia of Pete now a nostalgic appeal for um, Porter as, as it's losing customers to this uh, fancier and some of these cheaper uh, pale ale. Um, and, uh, but, but in the end, it actually was not very effective. And, and, and London Porter pretty much disappeared by the end of the 19th century. It, it, it just you know, completely, uh, really the biggest uh, supply 
producer of it was, was actually a, in Dublin, this Arthur Guinness in Dublin, right? And Guinness Stout, you know, pretty much replaced Porter and Mark. So, anyway, um, and, and the point of all of this is, um, right, that, that technology is involved in the production. Uh, but it's also about sort of product differentiation, trying to create market niches uh, with things like the stories of these legendary brewers and, um, you know, kind of these, these differences, which are increasingly becoming not, not as important, not really as, as, as big of a deal. Okay. Um, so the second uh, of these kinds of, of big changes, and now we're moving to our lager beers, uh, is moving from Britain to uh, Bavaria. Uh, and in the early modern period, uh, a new style of beer, a revolutionary style of beer, uh, called lager. And of course, lager in German means two things. Many things, but one of them is, is the actual um, uh, caves or chambers or storage houses where it's it's um, uh, uh, produced, and a new variety of yeast came about, lager yeast, uh, which um, uh, fermented uh, in a different way than, than the the the, the, uh, the usual yeast, which is used for making beer, uh, wine, <coughs> bread, just about everything. Right, this sort of standard. Yeast. And the Bavarian product was, was interesting because it fermented at lower temperatures. And, um, and, and this becomes important because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to achieve purity in there because, you know, the kinds, when, it's, when it's fermenting at these lower temperatures, the other uh, wild yeasts and, and other kinds of things that might attack it and, you know, kind of spoil the taste. Are, are just can't get that start, you know, because of the low temperatures. And so, you know, I mean, a, a, a typical um, uh, uh, just ale, right, made with non, with the top fermenting yeast, uh, is is fermenting, you know, in 18 to 20 degrees. Uh, whereas uh, this bottom fermenting, it can, it typically does at 8 to 10, but can continue to ferment slowly, uh, almost down to zero. Um, uh, and um, and so, and, and this was also took off in Bavaria. I mean, actually, it, it happens really all over Europe. And, and this, this it, it, there, there's still, I mean, the, the, the geneticists are still trying to trace down the origins of this 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 wacky vibrant in the east, um, uh, because it actually comes from two places. One is Patagonia, and everybody thought it was like this new world product. And the only problem with it is, is that it's actually known before 1492. And so, how the penguins were carrying you know, this lager beer, lager yeast. But it's, it, the other places that they, they, they found it is in Tibet, and that seems like a better bet for how it originally got there, and, and how it then, you know, kind of hybridized with the usual yeast. And, and, but it really takes off in Bavaria. And partly that's because of the, um, the laws that prevent brewing uh, during uh, the, the summer months. And so brewers would, would make these beers uh, um, and store them in kegs in these, these lagers, these underground cellars, uh, and, and then bring them out during the summer, right? And so, um, and, and, and this is, uh, becomes part of the whole sort of Bavarian culture of beer. And it's a very different beer. It's, uh, and it's, it's, it has a, a much more pure taste to it, okay? Um, and, and this is really taken off by the, by the mid 18th century, that, 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 that Bavarian beer is starting to get a reputation. Um, transportation markets are such that they're able to start exporting it, and so the industry really takes off. Um, uh, but the the real sort of industrial lager is a combination of um, British technology for um, the, the the large scale brewing, which of course porter and pale ale. Um, with this uh, um, Bavarian um, biological control of, of yeast. And it's this man, Gabriel Sabelmeyer, of the Schwatten Brewer, uh, that is really uh, um, sort of credited with bringing these two together. And his father was a brewer, and in, in the 18, late 1820s, early 1830s, 
he does kind of a journeyman tour of all of Europe, as, as brewers did, as, as really as all um, uh, um, uh, uh, apprentices and journeymen did. Uh, but he, he particularly went to um, Britain uh, and, and learned the technologies that were you know, kind of being used there um, and brought it back. Um, but in particular, in, in brewing, he created uh, what was the, the Munich uh, lager. And, and it's a dark beer. And of course, if you go to, if you go to uh, Munich today, you know, you'll get a Helles, which is, you know, a light beer, and it's not all that different from uh, the, the Pilsner Pale Lager that, that, you know, everybody kind of makes. Uh, but in the 19th century, Zeilmeyer, in sort of creating this, this distinctive Munich Lager that's associated with the town, uh, is, uh, is, is brewing a dark beer. Um, and, and partly it's using the technologies of, um, of malting. Um, but not sort of, you know, kind of adding the, the kind of caramel, which is, is forbidden by the Bavarian beer purity law, the Reinheitsgebot. Some people may have heard of the name, uh, and that's a whole other story that we don't really have time for. But um, is uh, uh, sort of trying to create this as a distinctively Munich beer. Uh, and he is enormously successful in making this kind of dark beer associated with uh, Munich. And in the 1840s, uh, especially after Munich is connected to European growing, European train uh, 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 railroad lines, uh, he's exporting beer all over the place um, in order to meet the demand for ice in the lagers. For a time in the 1850s, they're harvesting vast quantities of ice from the Bierenhorn uh, um, uh, glacier uh, and, and in nearby Austria, uh, just across the border, uh, and to, to power it in. Of course, you know, when, when refrigeration comes in by the 1870s, and refrigeration, incidentally, is, is a product of um, the, 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 well, I mean, everybody's trying to find methods of refrigeration, but the one that really wins out is, is a Bavarian invention, and it's financed by Zedelmeyer, among others, because beer was the biggest market for refrigeration at this time, lager beer. Anyway, so, uh, you know, Zedelmeyer is exporting this beer, and the problem, and this is always really the problem with these kinds of things, is that do you export the, the, the commodity, the product, or do you export the recipe? And, you know, brewers everywhere very quickly learned how to make a Munich uh, beer themselves. And, and so that kind of export, uh, import substitution. Um, is, is the thing. And, and really, the history of beer from the Middle Ages, the invention of hops beer, up to uh, really the present, uh, is always one of what's been called trickle trade, uh, which is to say, you know, kind of it, it moves from one place to another uh, as a kind of um, uh, exotic, valuable, elite sort of thing. Uh, the locals develop a taste for it, and then local brewers say, okay, we need to reverse engineer this, figure out how to make it, uh, and then they, in turn, start exporting it somewhere else, right, you know, and so this kind of, this, this product spreads. Um, and, and that's always the problem with exports, is, you know, how do you kind of balance those kinds of things. But Zeilmeyer is not at all um, doing this alone. And in fact, one of his buddies on this journeyman tour where he discovered you know, the secrets of British uh, ferment of mass production uh, was this man, Antoine Dreyer uh, of Vienna, also from a you know, prominent brewing family there. And he creates the Vienna water. And again, it's, it's using that uh, top, or uh, bottom fermenting Bavarian yeast, uh, which was not at all popular in Vienna at the time, but then as a way of make, of differentiating it, um, he uh, actually creates a kind of a, of a pale, which is it's not uh, a, a, the pale lager, um, but it's, it's sort of, a, a, of an amber color. And, and for like craft beer aficionados, if you order a Vienna, it's going to be an amber color, right, which is the same color as kind of the pale ales in, in Britain. Um, and, and, you know, you read these sources and it's very clear that they are developing these products 
as a form of market differentiation, of you know, kind of making their beer stand out from others um, by, okay, so Munich is this dark stuff, and we love, we know Munich beer is good, and so you know, you want to have that. And so Dreyer is trying to get this, um, trying to sort of find a little niche for his Vienna lager. Uh, but really, the, the big challenge and, and, and the, 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 the winner ultimately is going to be uh, Pilsner. Um, uh, the town of Pilsen in the prominent town of Western Bohemia, uh, in what's now the Czech Republic, um, it, it's actually its money is uh, based not on you know this kind of pure golden lager beer. It's it's Anne Francite money, uh, which is kind of an ironic sort of thing. But the, the town fathers invested their money in um, in building the, the the citizens' brewer, you know, kind of a collective thing, and they brought in this. Bavarian brewer role uh, to um, to actually run the thing, and uh, and so Grohl uses these local ingredients, um, the, the the Moravian malt, um, the, uh, the the very soft water, the local water there in Pilsen, um, but particularly the Zaz hops from the Zatek um, uh, Basin, which is nearby. And these hops really become the very distinctive, and, and, and a Pilsner has a very bitter hop <coughs> flavor, more so than the more malty, sorry, I'm, I'm geeking here, uh, Bavarian taste. But I mean, these, these sort of flavor profiles become a big part of how, you know, these styles are developed, but also of how, you know, they're trying to, to, to market their stuff. So anyway, Grohl, uh, um, you know, develops this, uh, this, this local, right? It's based on local ingredients. The only exotic thing is, of course, the Bavarian bottom fermenting yeast. Uh, and although, you know, at the time, it was actually uh, um, seen as a Bavarian beer, right? The, the idea of it coming to be a Pilsner um, was uh, that was that that comes later when it starts to when they start to export it, and actually that comes relatively slow too. So the the the, the beer is first brewed on October fifth, eighteen forty two. We actually have the precise date when Pilsner was invented, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but. You know, for decades, I mean, certainly, you know, until the, the, the railroads get connected in the 1860s, um, it's, uh, uh, it's very much a local thing. And by that point, there's, it's already being produced in lots of different towns of Bohemia, right? So that, that, that pale, right? And, and I mean, that's, you know, kind of the most distinctive thing about, you know, about Pilsner is the very golden pale color. And again, this is all built on uh, British advances in malting technology of, of, of you know, sort of how to, to transform that uh, starch, the barley malt, or barley grain, the starch, into fermentable sugars. Uh, and that's, again, uh, the, the subject of So anyway, so now by the mid-1860s, you've got like this whole spectrum of Central European lager theaters, right? From the, the dark, um, malty um, uh, uh, Munich beer to the, the kind of amber floral notes of the Vienna, and then uh, the crisp, golden, bitter uh, 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 Pilsner lager on kind of on this spectrum, and they're competing, and and that 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 spectrum, right? The color, those distinctive colors are precisely engineered by these brewers to, you know, kind of stand out in that marketplace, right, and to attract uh, customers. And, and they become very successful in doing so, I have to say. Um, now, this, this sort of, uh, this crystallization of beer styles, right, um, is, is, of course, also a product of the growing, you know, development of science and the standardization. And of course, you've got these giant, increasingly big factories that are producing the beer. Um, but then you also have this whole profession of brewing science. And their, their, their kind of basis for this is, is 
to this day an important thing, which is beer analysis, where they'll actually just use all of the chemical attributes, you know, of um, uh, you know the, the the residual sugars and the um, uh, uh, alcohol. Content. Anyway, they 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 just kind of trying to reduce the the the. the of this, this product down to its, its uh, um, uh, sort of uh, quantifiable markers. And then, you know, you can send the beer into any lab and they test it and they'll say, okay. And, and, and if it fits the requirements of, you know, being within that style, a Munich lager or a, uh, a, a Pilsner, then, then it becomes that, right? It's it, it sort of, this is in some ways constraining the creativity of brewers, but it's also doing that work uh, of, of, of grading uh, and valorizing that is so crucial to the, uh, the, the industrialization, the standardization, the commodification of organic products. Okay? And, and, and it, it's very much a um, uh, kind of a, this, this, this scientific sort of, of thing. Um, I'm going to digress for just a moment because it's not only happening here in Central Europe. It's also going on uh, in places like North America. And in North America, one of the things they have is they have lots of cheap rice and um, uh, uh, corn. And what they find is that actually in producing these light, clear, Pilsner-style pale lagers, uh, that stuff is great uh, for, again, for technology reasons that I won't go into, although if you ask, I, I can hear you <laughs> for, for a long time. But the point here is, is that, and, and, and this becomes kind of uh, sort of the, the, the a, a thing that beer connoisseurs often, you know, say, oh, Americans killed beer, right? They, they stopped using good European barley and started using these, these adjuncts, brewing other grains besides barley for brewing and you know, kind of all these things, and creating these, these massive, uh, this is the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and, 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 and the idea is, is that, you know, these, these sort of good old-fashioned European-style beers were, you know, that, 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 that brewers found that it was cheaper to make these adjunct bloggers and that you know they 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 hoodwinked the consuming public, and 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 you know taught them to drink these cheap uh, American beers, and, um, and and there's you know debates among brewing scientists in the United States, and there's this one guy Karl Rach, who's a who's uh, from Munich, you know trained in the old world style, you know, and he just he comes to the United States. He works in a lot of different breweries, and he's a very prominent brewing scientist. 1900, uh, but he's lamenting, you know, just how these American breweries have just ruined beer. And this, incidentally, is 20 years before Prohibition, which is usually what is, you know, blamed for the decline of American beers, that they're already having these debates, and, they, and the American beer brewers are saying, look, you know, do they drink this because they're unknowing, unsophisticated, or do they drink our light, crisp, clear beers because they like the taste? Right? And so this debate is going on, and really it's, 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 it's astonishing how much like the, 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 the Frankfurt School of, of you know, kind of post-war culture, or, well, actually, not post-war entirely, I mean, you know, so um, Benjamin uh, and, and uh, Adorno and these others kind of are, are having this debate 50 years later or so about, you know, the effects of, you know, capitalism on, on mass culture. Um, but you know these these Munich brewers are actually you know putting it in pretty much the same terms you know a good bit earlier. So it's it's really interesting to kind of watch these these kinds of debates playing out and, and um, so yeah. Okay, uh, so already by the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, you know we have these styles have developed. Um, and, uh, and it appears to me, it occurs to me that in putting together this slide presentation, I kind of reversed something. So we're gonna, we're gonna there's gonna be, I, I should have changed things around. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to these styles in, in a little while, but I have to talk about 
uh, they're spread around the world first. And, and I guess that's a good starting point, jumping off point from, from North America. Because of course, you know, at the, this is the same time uh, when, when this lager beer is, 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 is spreading around the world. And um, partly it's a product uh, of imperialism. Uh, and certainly, you know, European brewers are traveling the world and they're brewing beer you know, as, as they go with them. And, and that beer becomes very much a symbol of their superiority, right? And particularly when refrigeration makes it possible to brew in tropical climates and, you know, and the, and the purity of particularly a pale lager, a pilsner, um, when compared to the very strong taste of something like Mexican pulque, but other kinds of things as well, um, you know, becomes that kind of civilizational, you know, sort of sparks that civilizational discourse. Um, curious, this is actually uh, the, um, the, 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 the one on the far left is this Japanese brewery, um, which starts out actually um, very much wedded to uh, German methods. Um, and, I, and I love the way that they kind of use these geisha to localize the beer, even while, you know, kind of, you know, showing the modernity, the, the big modern factory in the background, and the first class car, although you just see the first, but you know what that means, um, you know. But what I particularly like about Japan um, is that they become uh, a beer empire of their own. And they're actually doing the same kinds of things that, that European brewers are doing in places like South Africa, you know, staring, looking down their nose at the local beers in Korea and in, um, in, 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 in uh, China. Uh, and, uh, and, and sort of, so they, they, they actually create their own um, beer empire. But then also in places like Mexico, um, where, where beer is. Uh, um, uh, again, sort of uh, posed as sort of the antithesis of these these dirty, potentially contaminating local beers, right? That local brews like Uke, you know, is that you can drink European beer and be, you know, uh, high status and, and all the rest, um, and, and so on. Uh, this is is actually uh, kind of the ways that these, these beers um, become localized. Uh, th this is actually a, uh, uh, it's from Taiwan, um, but the, you see versions of it in, 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 in China as well, uh, where they start brewing beer with all these wacky flavors, like clam beer and other kinds of things. I, I don't have Chinese, uh, so I, I can't, I mean, you know, is that Lai Chi or, or some kind of, but they, but they do brew these kinds of things with, you know, these sort of things. And, and, and you ask yourself, is that still really a Pilsner? Um, and to just sort of jump ahead, I guess my answer would be, well, is Bud Light Lime a Pilsner? <laughs> Uh, because in a way, it is the logical extension of brewing science and marketing and all the other things that beer is these days. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that pale lager category, which is itself, you know, kind of a product of convenience for the industry, just kind of keeps getting reworked, but in, in around new kinds of selling to new markets. Um, the Japanese actually are really um, uh, very important in the modernization of beer in the 20th century. And so they invented dry beer, they invented microfiltration, all of these things that, you know, and, and, and really what they're doing is they're making a beer that's more like, you know, the kinds of flavors that they want to be drinking. Uh, my favorite, there's a, a the, the, the when, when Commodore Perry arrives in 1854 to have to sign the Treaty of Trade with the Tokugawa um, uh, shogunate, um, Perry brings with him some kegs of, of um, essentially IPA, India Pale Ale, right, this sort of thing. And um, the, uh, uh, there's actually a samurai recorded kind of tasting notes of this of this early encounter, a Japanese encounter with, with Western beer. And he said, uh, tastes like bitter horse piss. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And I actually wrote an article in which I spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what he meant. Uh, but long story short, I mean, I, I really do think that they just, you know, they wanted something that was crisp, clean, and, um, and that's what a Pilsner was. And, and I mean, that whole sort of purity of beer, and, and, and even, you know, the, the Czech brewing scientists say that what, you know, the, 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 the secret sauce of Pilsner was just purity. Um, it was the cleanest beer, and that's, you know, I mean, it's that, in essence, the promise of, of industrial food processing. You know, you get all that flavor out, but, you know, I mean, what's, you know, what one person's flavor is another person's contamination, right? So, anyway, uh, and, and the Japanese were masters of that because, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the Japanese aesthetic for food, is, you know, kind of clean, pure. Uh, and then the, uh, oh, we'll skip that and move on. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot I can say about that too, but that's the problem with having a whole book and only you know, five minutes to talk about it. Um, so eventually what happens in the, the, um, the, the, the late 20th century is that all of these brewers go through this global consolidation. Um, and the outcome, these are the top 10 brewers in the world right now. Okay. Uh, AB InBev, which is headquartered in Belgium, and they're the makers of Stella Artois, and that's kind of their, their big brand. Um, but the company is actually run by um, Carlos Brito, who is essentially an investment banker from Brazil. Uh, and um, Heineken's next, and then number four is Carlsberg, and number five, uh, the only actual brewer from North America left in the top ten is Molson Coors, because of course Anheuser-Busch is owned by uh, InBev, and, or uh, was taken over by InBev, and then uh, Miller was taken over by SAB, uh, which is South African breweries, uh, but then InBev bought SAB too. And brands now are actually, I mean, honestly, brands are like a deck of cards, you know? And whenever they have a merger, you have to sort of reduce your market position to, you know, whatever the local antitrust authorities will let you control of the market. And so they'll shuffle the deck around, you know? And I'll trade you uh, uh, Corona for, um, you know, and, and, and these brands may be sold by different companies in different uh, uh, different countries. Again, just meeting that uh, you know that that uh, um, the, those antitrust regulations. But anyway, apart from those, and and Heineken and Carlsberg, what's curious about them, and also about uh, uh, Guinness, right? Which are the sort of the three big European companies that are still independent, right? Uh, is that they're all from very small countries. And even Belgium's a small country. And I think, you know, sort of being forced into exporting rather than having a big domestic market, that in this battle that what's been called the dance of the elephants, you know, as these increasingly enormous, you know, breweries are buying each other up for fear of getting bought up themselves, um, they are... Um, you know, the established brands with big local markets are, are just not able to, to, to you know, they're, they're, they're too inward gazing, right? They're not able to, to manage that, that, that market. And so that's why Budweiser gets bought up by these upstarts. Um, which, I mean, up until, you know, practically 2000 is still by far the world's biggest brewer. And then it just, you know, in less than 10 years, it all falls apart. Um, also, Heineken and Carlsberg are both um, uh, uh, privately held companies, which actually limited their ability to grow a little bit because they couldn't raise capital, but then it meant that they could not be bought up by, by InBev, um, which, which basically wants to, to buy everything. And what's left, and, and really the conclusion of all this, is that now beer is, is run outside of Europe and North America. Right? All of these other brewers, right? Snow, Qingdao, and Yanjing are all uh, uh, Chinese brewers. Uh, Asahi and Kirin are Japanese. Castle is 
in theory, a French company, although it's actually its, it's, its biggest markets are in Africa, is that uh, and SAB, right, which you know is now part of Indeb, but was for a long time number two, right? You know, is that the the, the real beer market is is all among the the young populations of you know the global south, uh, and and those of us in the global north are all you know getting a feed and, and drinking wine instead of something. Anyway, so that's kind of the, where the, the market is going. I'm going to uh, wrap things up really quickly. And it, actually, it occurs to me, I didn't, I, did I not do, I mean, I may have left that, that slide completely out, which would be a bummer. But if not, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to it. But anyway, so the, the last piece of the puzzle, right, is the reaction against all of this commodification, the reaction against the, the control of big beer. And of course, that's the craft revolution. Um, yeah. And this is actually the Revolution Brewery in Chicago. Uh, they specialize in um, bourbon barrel aged, uh, you know, imperial stouts and other big beers. Uh, I love the kind of the use of that, that iconic playing with the Soviet era um, things. And then, of course, you've got the masculine, you know, kind of the, the IPAs, the arrogant bastard ale <laughs> of the Stone Brewery in California. And, and Lots to be said about gender and, and race and, and other kinds of things in this, this craft beer movement, right? But the whole point of craft beer, right, is that it's the antithesis of that corporate capitalist, all the rest thing. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and of course, it's not. But um, now, and, and we're getting to my misplaced slide, which I should have done earlier, but that those Belgian beers, right, which were always sort of seen as being kind of the, the one real traditional beer that through all of these changes has not changed, and that is the, the Lambic, right? This is the spontaneously fermented um, beers of, of, of Belgium that, you know, kind of have these very barnyardy flavors and, you know, just the, 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 the holy grail of the, of the, the beer connoisseur. Uh, and, 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 and the true expression of the terroir, right? Because, I mean, literally, they're, they're, it's just whatever's kind of floating around in the brewery and all that stuff. Um, and, and it's marketed, you know, kind of with this sort of Bruegel era peasants, you know, and if you go to the, the right, you know, sort of um, taverns there in Brussels, they'll actually serve it in little versions of those ceramic cups that make you think you're a, broil, a peasant in Bruegel, a Bruegel peasant. Uh, but the killer is, that brewing scientists in the 19th century saying, yeah, Blambic, it's only, uh, it's, it's, it's a product of the, of, 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 of the 19th century. That, that they, and, and here's the thing, right, is that, uh, so, so Lambic is this spontaneously fermented uh, beer um, in, a, in an age that's increasingly of, 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 of pure beer yeast. And that's another scientific thing I didn't go into. But um, it's, it's what they actually they'll do is they'll blend. And so there's different kinds of lambics that you can get. You can get a, a, a guz, which is an old lambic mixed with a younger lambic, and it creates a sort of a spontaneous fermentation, or a, a secondary fermentation. Um, and then they'll mix it with sour cherry to make creek, or they'll mix it with uh, uh, raspberries to make framboise, and, and, and these other kinds of things. Um, but they bottle it in second and non-returnable champagne bottles, right? Which is another industry that was marketing this industrial product with the nostalgia of the past, right? Uh, and, and so the Lambic industry is, you know, a product of capitalism, of industrial capitalism. And if you look at the old uh, um, advertisements, they're not selling to peasants. This is, you know, a, a bourgeois Brussels guy, you know, out on the town, you know, kind of. Th th this was the, the market at the time. That th this was very much a cabaret, you know, kind of, of thing. So, essentially, Lambic and the wider craft beer is creating a new way of commodifying that beer, right? You know, sort of that creating narratives to valorize the, the, the sale of, of beer, um, of, of these beers, 
uh, for you know a new sort of connoisseur market, right? And and the whole thing about you know of these strong tastes like a IPA, you know, is is a product of that sort of post-industrial, you know, when you're no longer worried what your food is really there, then you go out for these wacky tastes, or you know when you want to you know uh, assert your masculinity. You know, you have that stone, arrogant bastard fear, Adolf. You know, and, and so that's just another way. I mean, in a sense, craft beer is, you know, it's sort of a, a capitalist beer for the 21st century. Um, so that's sort of my take on, on how beer became a, a global commodity. And uh, I haven't sent the manuscript off yet, so any questions you have will help me again to further refine the argument, and um, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Anthony Dele. I'm a professor at Early Modern Italian Renaissance. So I had a, a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm all excited to go to the LCBO and you know, <laughs> buy a variety and do some more case testing. Um, I had a, I had, a, I had one really quick question, and then I had a, a second more developed one. But the, the, the first one is just how, why you're including sake. You sort of said that rice, and I guess it's different than if you're including sake. Why not wine? But I guess that's completely different. But uh, but uh, the, the second one has to do with uh, more history, more function, and why there's this shift in the 19th century when beer turns from a, a, an essential food group in early modern Europe, you know, where children are having beer soup for breakfast and all this sort of stuff. It does it turn into a you know a, a luxury commodity? What is the function of beer in the 19th century? Or is this is this a, a new luxury that forcing our people, or is there still this medicinal medicinal um, you know essential food group idea that there was in early modern Europe? Uh, so yeah, the second one about uh, function. Yeah, now that now I'm going to do those in reverse order because that's a really good question, and um, and I really do think that 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 transition from beer as food to beer as entertainment happens in the 19th century, and that is part of the appeal of the pale water, right? And the shift from the dark Munich beer uh, and, and porter, you know, which are very caloric beers, to those lighter, and, and, and the British, even without doing bottom fermentation, do essentially the, 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 the non-lager equivalent of that. And even the Germans do, you know, I mean, so if you go to Kolsch, uh, Cologne, Kolsch is, is basically uh, an ale that's pretending to be a lager, right? And it's that light flavor, and, and there's a variety of reasons that people have talked about. So one of them is, is that actually lowering the alcohol content, right? And that as, you know, working in industry, you don't want to be too drunk, especially at the 20th century driving cars, uh, so it's a, a, a lager is, I mean, a, 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 the, the, the Pilsner is a, is a temperance beer. Uh, or it's, it's at least viewed that way, right? And, and, and certainly in temperance debates, for example, in the United States, or you know, around Prohibition and afterwards, it's, it's, it's a beer, you know, is sort of the, is the enemy of, of, of the real demon whiskey or demon rum or whatever. So that's part of it. Uh, the purity is certainly part of it. But also, just it's 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 lighter, it's fizzy, it doesn't slow you down if you're going to be playing sports or dancing or doing all these other activities, right? And so, I mean, yeah, you may drink a beer with dinner, but it's no longer dinner, right? The way it was, it, you know, for you know workers before then, and certainly up through. I mean, you know, and and, and I mean, you know, that was part of the appeal of uh, of Munich lager, really, because think about it, the. The, the, the potato famine of the 1840s did not stop in Ireland, right? It spreads all over Northern Europe, and what would then a, an important part of, I mean, the hunger years is, is how they're known in Germany, at, you know, in the 1840s. And being able to drink this, you know, heavy, caloric, you know, sturdy Munich lager was part of the appeal of. And so I think there is a fundamental shift, right? And we can think about different ways that that, uh, you know, sort of cultures think about alcoholic beverages, right? Just think about the kind of the Northern European, and I mean, you know, this is stereotype, but, but there is some truth to it, right? The, the difference between, you know, how Northern Europeans and Mediterraneans think about alcohol, right? 
you know, it's drug in Northern Europe, it's food in, 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 in Southern Europe, mm -hmm. right? You know, you drink it with a meal, uh, as opposed to, you know, having an aquavit until you're blotto. Um, and, and, I mean, you know, and there's a whole kind of literature of the anthropology of drink that, you know, asks those kinds of questions. And, 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 and I think that those kinds of shifts do happen and that, that the 19th century is, is a kind of a crucial moment for it and I think it's precisely that. In terms of your first question about what to include and what not, honestly, I am, you know, not so terribly interested in a taxonomy of what or is or is not beer because I mean you know like the beer is an, you know it's a European word and, and you know I mean how do we we sort of sake or cookie or these other kinds of things and the 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 cases that I deal with and I deal with in in looking at early modern Europe and the kind of the increasing commercialization and the rise of London Porter and Bavarian beer. Uh, and but uh, hops beer in, in, in Northern Europe in, in the late Middle Ages is I did not want this to be strictly a European story, and so I examined Mexico and uh, um, and Japan as two societies where capitalism is making inroads. Obviously, you know in Mexico it's it's a colonial version of capitalism, silver exports that sort of drive the early modern and global economy uh, on the one hand, and then Japan has its own sort of early modern dynamic. Right? But in both of those cases, you have very similar stories of uh, the increasing commercialization of the local alcoholic product, um, pulque and, and sake, and, uh, and, and, and they follow the, the, the same patterns of, of um, bifurcated markets, where you've got you know, this rot gut for the, the masses, and then you know, a more refined version for you know, either the samurai elite or, you know, the, the, the British, or the British, uh, uh, the, the Mexican local aristocracy, right? You, you see these same dynamics, and, and it's, and, you know, I mean, so the, in one version of this book, you know, I was, I was very much making it a history of capitalism and, and trying to shoehorn, you know, these different cases into, you know, kind of capitalist development and, and, and God, is that a, Fame mission, but but you know I mean, really it's it's just about it, 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 I'm, I'm doing it for convenience to, to, to tell a story and and those were convenient cases and so you know I'm I, I'm not gonna argue with somebody who says that's wine that's <laughs> something else you know you're right so there was one back here hi uh, my name is Sam Challen I'm a uh, MA student and a big beer fan um, <laughs> thank you very much for the lecture this combines two of uh, you know, two of the most uh, noble things in the world, I think, uh, beer and history. Um, so it, it, you surprised me uh, when you said that, uh, as, as I gather, that the, uh, the lager um, yeast uh, is not native to, um, to Central Europe. And, and instead, it's you know found in like Patagonia and, and, and Tibet. Which, which well, all right. So so uh, 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 Saccharomyces. I've never actually, I, mean, I, 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 I see it in writing, I've never actually heard it pronounced, I have no idea, but it, th th that variety uh, of yeast is found in, uh, as I said, Tibet and Patagonia. It hybridizes with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the basic, you know, ale, wine, every other brewer's yeast. Uh, and and that, that product is what comes to be known as Saccharomyces uh, um, pastorianus. Or um, the, 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 which is now the classic lager yeast, and uh, and nobody knows where that happened, um, and and the geneticists do their little you know kind of recreate these kinds of things, but I'm not going to get too worked up about where that until you know we actually have some more kinds of things. I'm, I'm I, I sort of uh, yeah. So did that answer your question? I kind of jumped in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So there's a lot of questions. So. Here, 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 and here, and here. Okay, so, yes. Uh, me? Yes. Uh, thank you, I'm Dr. Salim, and I'm a first year PhD student. Uh, thank you for your fantastic presentation. And my question is the place of, about the place of ideology here in this introduction and distribution of uh, beer, especially during the Cold War period, for example. If there were any instances where, you know, uh, East Germans or West Germans were refusing to drink or 
these kind of stories, and also among empires and nation states there. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I mean, that, so beer does come to be seen as a kind of a, a civilizational good during these kinds of things. And there are, during the Cold War, battles over it. But of course, the Cold War is, in large part, a battle of who can deliver consumer goods. And so um, communist societies, and particularly ones in Eastern Europe, are trying to deliver uh, beer uh, to the proletariat, right? You know, they sort of do that, uh, even while they're actually trying to earn foreign exchange by exporting the good stuff abroad. Um, and, and, and so uh, th there's a lot of stuff going on there. Incidentally, um, in those communist bloc countries, women are actually allowed to work in, in, in breweries a lot more than they are in, in the West. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And, 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 and women actually are, are better able to consume the beer as well. So, so that's kind of going on there. One of the really interesting cases is China. And, um, and, and China is a place where they really, you know, until, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, in the 19th century, it's very much a foreign product. And, and it gradually starts to get uh, localized, uh, first among, you know, kind of this Western-oriented intelligentsia. Uh, but they immediately attach a Chinese uh, um, uh, sort of lineage to it, saying that this was actually first brewed here in the, in the Han Dynasty, you know, 2,000 years ago. And so we really should consider it to be a Chinese product. And they're so successful in doing that, that under Mao, beer comes to be seen as, you know, not a superfluous kind of Western, you know, imperialist thing to be kicked out, but actually something to, to feed the, 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 uh, the working classes. The curious thing about that, though, is, is that beer actually reaches a peak at the height of the Great Leap Famine. Uh, and that kind of is a, sort of an interesting part of the story of you know, how Mao, for all of his affectation for the, the Chinese peasantry, is actually, like everybody else at this point, you know, you know, exploiting the peasantry to you know, further national industrial development. So, um, there's lots more stories, because, I mean, it, it really is, and especially, you know, when you're reading, like, the German press, you know, that, 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 that it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's German civilization that's conquering the world. Although they don't actually even say conquering the world, they, they kind of chuckle as German beers displace the English in particular, um, but that it's the selfless work of these Teutonic, you know, Brewers who have traveled the world and, and, and brought civilization to these benighted countries. So, so there, there's, there's just a, a, a ton of stuff I can say, but there's lots of other questions. So there was one back here. Hi, um, I'm Diane. I'm up here, uh, PhD. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm obsessed with that map that you had mm -hmm. of all the um, different brands, um, and it's I find it wildly disheartening that um, Kenya and Tusker and Zambia and Mosi are effectively the same thing as Molson Canadian. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if we can go back to earlier in your talk, you were talking about um, how like in colonial Africa, which is one of my areas of interest, um, brewing was feminized labor and it wasn't capitalist production and all of that. And I'm wondering if you can expand on, or if you do in the book, expand on um, when and how the European model of pale ale kind of like eclipses that. And yeah, I'm just wondering if you could so the African story, and it, and it differs, you know, across regions. There is no one African story of beer, just as there's no one native African beer, uh, is is a really interesting one, um, because so I mean, basically, beer is good for two things. Okay? One is socializing, and the other is mobilizing labor, and that's been true since the time of the pharaohs, and. Um, and many societies in Africa uh, used, did, did brews, you know, uh, sort of have, have beer festivals uh, for, um, uh, you know, harvests and other kinds of communal labor, right, to, to sort of pay people for engaging in doing these common good things. Um, 
And of course, you know, the women who are, uh, you know, the wives of the big man or whatever, and again, I, I, I apologize for, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of collapsing lots of, a huge amount of archaeological, uh, anthropological literature and, and complexity down, but, but just bear with me. Um, you know, I mean, they are doing a lot of that ideological work we were talking about a minute ago, you know, in supporting these, you know, societies and also the political structures govern them, right, you know, the, where the big man can control the young guy's access to women and beer, basically, um, and, and in that way run these societies. The arrival of Europeans disrupts everything, because of course Europeans want access to that native labor, and they're willing to pay for it, not much, but, but more certainly than, you know, I mean, in a subsistence society, and that just throws everything out of whack. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, it's, you know, Chinua and Chibi's, uh, things fall apart, you know, kind of, it's that, that same sort of story about how, you know, uh, the, these the old rules kind of break down. And, and, and these brewing festivals, even in societies that, that, that weren't typically, I mean, even, you know, kind of pastoral societies that didn't even drink much grain beer, uh, start to, in, in many cases, start to brew, right? You know, as, as those kind of traditional life ways change. Um, but of course, you have these men then who are going into work on, you know, the mines or agriculture and all these other kinds of things, right? And they bring back money and they can buy their own beer, right? And they can challenge the big man and they can do all these kinds of things. And, um, but, so that's, I mean, that's, that's good for, you know, well, it, 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 it is what it is. And, but then also, you know, you get enough of these workers in towns like Johannesburg or Durban or wherever, right, and they're a danger, especially if they're getting drunk, right? And, uh, and, and, and they're actually bringing in their wives or their women or just anybody to brew for them because, you know, they can now, you know, they've got money to pay for grain to pay, and they can drink whenever they want, right? And so the colonial government, beginning about 1907 in, South, in South, Southern Africa, British colonial government, uh, bans women's brewing and they set up these municipal beer halls. And, and they're organized in a way to control the drinking. They're produced in, you know, municipal breweries um, and uh, one classic quote of it, it's like drinking in a cage, right? It's very prescribed about how they would do it. They'd get one little ticket and, and, and so on. So there's a, just wonderful kinds of stuff going on there. And incidentally, the women uh, the, become kind of anti-apartheid you know, struggles. And, and they, these shabines, right? It's an Irish word, but it comes to mean, you know, these kind of you know, bootleg taverns, uh, and these Shabin queens, as they're called, right, become kind of anti-apartheid fighters because the, the revenues from these municipal beer halls are being used uh, to actually finance the apartheid system. You know, even in its early days, of, of, you know, the municipal, the black township governments and the police, right, you know, and so it's kind of a vicious circle there. Um, so, complicated histories that I try to gesture to in that section of the chapter of the Empire chap, you know. So, Thank you. There, there's a lot more there, but did you have a question? No, some, somebody, you, no, you, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, Eric, for you. Um, and there's echoing people, thank you so much for interesting presentation, and I'm drinking water, and I'm myself thirsty. Um, <laughs> My work focuses on uh, international cultural relations, mostly music and visual arts, but oftentimes I stumble upon documents dealing or speak about culinary diplomacy or food diplomacy. And so I'm wondering, uh, especially thinking about your roadmap and this craft revolution slide, if you could talk about the place of beer in state-based cultural diplomacy or nation branding initiatives. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that too is kind of a big thing. Um, and one of the, the big battles, so in this kind of struggle over defining the meaning of styles, uh, already in the 19th century, you know, is that terroir in France 
is this kind of concept of the taste of the place. But it's in law, it's uh, kind of enshrined in the idea that you can't call it champagne unless it's actually from a legally prescribed district of champagne. Right? If you're outside here, across the street, it's still not champagne, but you know. And, and, and that's, you know, I mean, a pretty important part of, of uh, you know, exports of these kinds of goods. And I, I mean, you know, so, so gastro diplomacy or culinary diplomacy is often about, you know, exporting high value agricultural products. Um, and the brewers of Pilsen, but also of Munich, want to get that same kind of protection. You know, because brewers all over are brewing their Pilsner, they're brewing their Munich lager. And the imperial governments in Vienna and Berlin uh, say no, right? Because the brewers of northern, of, of you know, of, of, of Brandenburg or of, of, of Vienna are making a lot of money selling what they're calling Pilsner and calling Munich beer, right? And, and this becomes actually a a battle, a running battle that, that doesn't get resolved for quite some time between first uh, uh, the, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany, uh, but after World War I, uh, the Czechs are still trying to grant, get you know, control of the name Pilsner attached to you know, beers from Pilsner, right? that nobody else can call it that. And, and this gets caught up in Nazi ideology uh, of um, the, uh, um, that, that the Pilsner Citizens Brewery is, is, is declared to be a, uh, a Jewish brewery. Um, and that actually, you know, I mean, these, these Nazi officials are actually drawing up lists of, you know, that you should buy beer from these good German breweries, but not these Jewish breweries. And um, wow. It, it, anyway, that and, and is 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 a very kind of a long running battle. That you know, I mean, it it, it doesn't explain all of you know that kind of Sudeten kind of politics of, of of German Czech politics between the wars, but it's certainly an expression of it. Um, and and so yeah, I mean that's sort of a, a big a big part of of what's uh, uh, of sort of I guess the, the biggest example of that kind of nation branding. But I mean, there's so many others that you know we can talk about, um, and and the ways that uh, um, th that that people try, especially in in, in modern times. Um, there's a wonderful article on Georgian beer and the ways that they're, they're basically trying to market Pilsner using these kinds of traditional, I mean, you know, the, whatever the, the Georgian version of, of Lambic Watts, right, you know, this kind of stuff that they were selling, right, you know, and, 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 and the ways that, that that sort of nostalgia gets, yeah, I mean, actually, so gastro diplomacy has become, I think, one of the most exciting areas of food studies research and, and, you know, sort of looking at the ways that, that, that tourism and, and, you know, agricultural exports and, and such are, you know, sort of get caught up in these kinds of things. So, yeah, that's... Was there more to that question or is that pretty much... No, I was just trying to get a sense of... Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, it's like everybody's question, you know, kind of like has 16 answers to, to get to everybody. Was Budweiser just the name? Related well, to that, yeah, that's, no, that's actually that's a very that's good style. thing, and, and 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 so you know the the, the town of Budweiser yeah. uh, did was was well known, and, and it was actually exported in the late eighteenth century to uh, um, uh, uh, nobles throughout the region. Curiously, though, it was not actually did not go over to lager beer until the eighteen fifties, which is late compared to these other Czech towns. And, and, and really when, when um, uh, 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 Bush, uh, I think it was Adolphus, you know, they just keep repeating Adolphus and Augustus. 
I can't keep them straight. But anyway, and, and his buddy Conrad, somebody or another, they, they, they're, they're <laughs> touring around. I mean, and so the, the original Budweiser, and, and it gets involved in these, in these um, basically, you know, uh, um, the, the copyright lawsuits, you know, of, of brands, you know, and trade, trademark infringement lawsuits, because, you know, they're, they're selling what they call Budweiser, and, and then they get this whole legal debate, in, I mean, in court legal, uh, you know, over whether it really is a style, or is it just a trade name? And, I mean, and this whole thing is really about what is the meaning of style, you know, because, I mean, champagne, you know, is a style of wine that's protected in one way, right, and that is actually attached to a piece of land. Beer style, and, and it's, it's very complicated, and, and, and it's, it's just very wacky the ways, as, as Germans are trying to figure out what to do with this, and I'm sure everybody else is as well, but I mean, the, the, in the German case, you know, is trying to formulate a, do a legal doctrine for dealing with that. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry, it's, 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 it's very complicated. There was a question back here? <laughs> Answer is both, um, and the reason for that is is that you know there's a sort of an appeal of the exotic of, of having. So if you're not in in Ireland, you know, and, and having an Irish beer, there's there's some kind of value to be had from that. But Guinness is largely successful at localizing, it, right? And so actually, one of Guinness's biggest markets, you know, outside of the Irish diaspora, is in Africa. And, um, and, and, and it's, 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 it's very much, because it's brewed in Africa, and it, it has African identities uh, that are, you know, I mean, they're similar to the ways that we think of it. It's, it's around power, actually, is the way it, it, it uh, uh, does that. And so, so I think that, that um, you know, that, that, that both that, that, that sort of local, but also the universal, in, in very curious ways, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, having your cake and eating it too. You can, you know, have a local beer. And, and I mean, so at one level, beer is like the ultimate local product because it's basically water, right? And it's totally uneconomical to ship beer long distances unless there's some particular value like uh, lamb, right? You know, and, 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 uh, and, and part of the reason why this whole trickle trade takes off is because it's just, you know, I mean, shipping water is just totally not economically uh, uh, feasible. And, it, and as long as somebody can produce, a, you know, a good enough version of Pilsner or whatever else, you know, people are not going to shell out the extra money to pay for it unless there's, you know, some very good reason. And so I, I think that the value of it is, you know, sort of this complex calculus of just, you know, cost on one hand and, and the economics of it, but also the ways in which people market it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Now, when brewing first arrives in the global south, in Latin America, I assume this is true for Africa as well, um, in two countries that are largely primary product exporting countries, it comes as industrial brewing. And it's like the first really big factories in these countries. I, 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 much, I think even more so than, than textiles, you know, textiles in Orizaba, but there was nothing like the Cerveceria Cuauhtémoc in like the 1890s or whenever it was that it was, that it was and, and they even put like line drawings of this modern, of this factory in their, in their, uh, in their ads. 
and things like this. How much of the sort of transfer of beer, industrial beer brewing technology to places like Mexico was about, I don't know, a, a, a positive valorization of an industrial product, which you would think would be um, counterintuitive. People wouldn't want to drink something coming out of a factory. But I'm just curious about that. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I mean, Arnie Bauer was writing about this stuff a while back. And, and you know, it's sort of the modernizing goods, right? And, and especially if, you know, if, if pulque, you know, which is, you know, your local sort of artisanal product is so terribly associated with pollution and contamination. Having a pure, modern machine where you're getting it out of a glass bottle, you know it's been sealed at the factory, you know it has been adulterated uh, the way that pulque was, and, and these other kinds of things, right? I mean, never mind the, the Andean chicha, where it's basically made by women spitting into it. Um, <laughs> You know, is that, that those kinds of things, then, uh, that, and, 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 and then it's, it's also, you know, again, it's like that importation of European technology. So it has to be good, and certainly better than that. And so, yeah, I think that that's, that's uh, very much what's, you know, driving that. And there's a kind of curious moment, it happens in Mexico in the 40s, uh, where, um, uh, where it becomes sort of this, this national product, right, where they nationalize the market for it, and, um, and and there's a wonderful ad, a long-running ad for Corona uh, that says, 20 million Mexicans can't be mistaken. And of course, that's like the census, that's the number of Mexicans there are, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 20 million. million. <laughs> and, and, they, they, you know, and, and I mean, you know, that it's sort of a, a over-the-top claim that everybody was drinking it. But th that was so different from the, the late 19th century version where it's just an elite of Europeanized people. The idea that this is a mass market, and so that there's there's big social changes that have happened as these things, you know, spread out. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Carl, I'm a second year master student um, here in history. Um, disclaimer: I don't drink alcohol, but I find this stuff very interesting. Um, so I originally from the Philippines, and our national beer is San Miguel. Um, I know. The fact that it was chartered uh, by Spain in 1890, and it's largely ale. And from what I remember from commercials of Manny Pacquiao endorsing the beer, it also has this Pilsen like um, variant. And so, uh, two questions. So, one, what's the story of lager beer in southern Europe, particularly in Spain? And number two, how much do you know about the story of beer in uh, the Southeast Asia region? Um, if the Philippines, if you could. Yeah, so in terms of Spain and really all through the Mediterranean, um, that's a product of the sort of industrial spread of lager in the, the late 19th century. And so it's, you know, in, in, in Italy and in Spain and Greece and all these other places. And really in Egypt and, and, and the other you know, side of the Mediterranean as well, right? You know, that this becomes, and it's, you know, it's very much geared toward an urban industrial kind of, uh, Market, uh, working class uh, uh, people, and uh, and yeah, it, it 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 certainly gets taken abroad by the imperial by the Spanish imperialists as well. And and a curious story about uh, um, uh, San Miguel is that uh, during World War II, when the Japanese occupation of the Philippines, uh, they actually take over the brewery and they 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 ship the the San Miguel. Uh, to um, uh, the Japanese military, and the Japanese beers are actually being given to the locals because they thought San Miguel was better. Uh, which is sort of an interesting story. Um, Southeast Asia, more broadly, um, is uh, I think so. So one of the the other early beers is is Tiger beer in Singapore, mm -hmm. and and. This is, uh, as with a lot, it, it, it's part of the extension of European imperial uh, power. And so in this case, I mean, it's, it's actually a Heineken brewery, but it's established. Heineken wanted to do something in Indonesia, and they couldn't make it work. And so they partnered with a couple of like mineral water sales, English mineral 
Singapore, or salesman in Singapore to, to establish what became the Tiger Factory. Uh, and, and so that's really about you know, Heineken's sort of global growth, and, and we can see other examples of that there. Uh, curiously, um, Malaysia is also a, a, a big um, Guinness outlet, and it's, 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 it's largely Chinese. Uh, Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia that is drinking it. And so, uh, anyway, th th this is a story, and it's kind of like the, what I found with the, the tacos around the world is that I don't think there is a sort of a single logic. It's all kind of, I mean, if you look at it from the historian's perspective, it's all these kind of local stories. Uh, that and, and I mean, yeah, it follows these larger kinds of things, but when you really dig down to the granular level, you just get kind of wacky um, things like that. And but but I think the larger idea of you know kind of that this is for local elites a way of tasting European modernity is I guess the larger takeaway for that, and then it becomes you know kind of. You know, as with you know the the, the the communist Chinese brewing trying to brew beer for the masses, right? You know, it's it's the cheapest alcohol that you can mass produce for you know the market. So I know there were other questions, but I guess you're saying well. Uh, I guess if you want to build something, you can add something so that then you can go to class or something. Yeah, actually, I just had a bit of a simple question. Is there a capitalist free beer? Capitalist free beer? Ah, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, free beer? Didn't Doug Ford want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. What would a capitalist free beer be? I, I, you'll have to you'll have to ask that one. I don't know. My guess is that under capitalism, nothing is free. Right. So, you know, I think Milton Friedman said something about that. Okay, well, thank you very much.